uh, welcome to today's Tuesday topic, uh, being anti-racist workshop one, what are the characteristics and anecdotes of white supremacist culture, brought to you by uh, Lidavez Sawyer, go ahead and wave so they can see you, uh, and uh, Lindsay Edwards, uh, our friends from, uh, uh, I know it's Scheller 11th Street, but Stephen I'm- Stephen and Sandra Scheller. Stephen and Sandra yeah. Scheller 11th Street. Um, I'd like to thank those of you who are joining us online. We may have a few more folks join us here in the room. Um, and uh, just a reminder, if you uh, get a chance, visit uh, drexel.edu slash cnhp slash news slash Tuesday topics so you can see the other great events that we have coming up. If you're ever in one of our hallways and you see one of our Tuesday topic signs, aim your smartphone camera at the little bug that has Tuesday topics in the corner and you can read, it'll take you straight to your, to the, to the webpage. So you can see all of the events. Uh, and uh, off we go. Off we go. All right. <laughs> John. So we have a, a smaller presence here in person and a larger presence online. And we are sitting at this end to uh, for the camera to help see us. So we'll, we'll try to direct our attention to the online community as much as possible. So I think everyone has the slides they were sent out to the online community. Um, we have our contact information and titles here. Anything you wanna say about yourself? Lydia Beth Sawyer. Um, for those of you who are not um, completely familiar, we're from 11th Street Family Health Center. Um, as Darren had indicated, and I'm a director of community health wellness and strategic partnerships, also part of the Drexel's um, CNHP Diversity, Equity, Inclusion Board. Um, and I am a graduate of Drexel from the Creative Arts Therapies Department and practice as the CAT site director at 11th Street and um, clinically practice as a board certified dance movement therapist. Welcome. Yeah, welcome. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> <clears throat> Um, so speaking of welcomings, you know, anytime we're doing anti-racism work, we're also doing anti-oppressive work. Um, so there, I, I'm going to offer, it's called a diversity welcome or an inclusive welcoming that can be found at um, trainingforchange.org. <clears throat> so this is a tool that's often used um, to greet as, as an inclusive measure. So I would like to welcome today uh, people of all genders. This may include people who identify as women, men, trans, gender, queer, or others. People of African descent, black, African-American, brown bodied, Asian descent, Arab descent, European descent, those who identify as Hispanic, Latina X, people indigenous to this land, and people of mixed or multiple descents. Um, I'd like to welcome the languages spoken here, Spanish, English, sign language. Are there any other languages present in this room? Or online, you can type it. <laughs> <laughs> um, people of different class backgrounds, so that's working class, middle class, owning class, or who aren't sure where they fit in on the class spectrum. Um, people who are currently, who currently struggle with getting access to the resources necessary for survival, like health, health care, adequate housing, reliable transportation and childcare, and people who currently have more access to those resources. People with disabilities, visible or invisible, gay, lesbian, bisexual, heterosexual, pansexual, queer, or others for whom none of the labels fit. Your bodies and the different ways you experience yours. That can include bodies with chronic pain, strength, tension, etc. Survivors, people who identify as activists and people who don't. Single, married, partnered, dating, in monogamous or polyamorous relations. Those who are sexually active and those who aren't. Those in their teens, 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, we'll go up to 90s. <laughs> um, we welcome your emotions in here, especially. Joy, bliss, 
grief, rage, indignation, contentment, disappointment, happiness. We, um, we welcome those who support you to be here, your families, genetic and otherwise, people with different faiths, religious traditions, faith practices, private practices don't belonging, that don't belong to a tradition, agnostics, atheists, and seekers. We welcome those dear to us who have died and to our elders, those in our lives who have passed away. Thank you all. Thank you. So for today's agenda, we're going to go into individual body practice um, because we do recognize that we will be um, encountering difficult conversations in today's session. Um, we'll be moving on to defining white supremacist culture, describing five white supremacist culture characteristics and antidotes. Um, we're gonna be presenting a case study um, with a script attached to it. Uh, group work with identifying character characteristics, which will also be part of the online audience as well. Um, an antidote, which we may or may not be able to share, um, anticipating rich discussion as a result. And then a communal body practice um, so that we can all as a collective be able to um, have a sense of catharsis after today's conversation. Thank you. Um, so, you know, discussion of racism, um, it, there's a lot of uh, literature that supports that it. it's a very embodied experience. And I brought um, My Grandmother's Hands, which has become my, my textbook for the moment by Resma Menachem, um, who, who talks about uh, racism as the experience of, of racialized oppression and trauma. Um, and so if, you, if you're coming at it from a, a trauma perspective, he, one of the quotes that we've highlighted, white bodied, and he says white bodied supremacy, um, is the result of unresolved racialized trauma passed through our DNA. It cannot be healed through logic. It must be healed through intuitive somatic practices. So in that vein, we're gonna prepare ourselves um, with a, a, a small body practice now. And for all of you online, we hope that you participate um, with us because even if you're not here amongst us, the discussion of it will bring about body, um, body reactions, mm -hmm. okay? So this is, this is more of an individualized practice, but collectively, uh, we'll just kind of ground our feet into the floor. John, one of our participants has already started with his neck. <laughs> We're gonna take some deep breaths in together. So you will breathe in through our nose and out audibly through our mouths. Breathing in and out. Feel your body settle on the exhale. In and out. One more nice deep breath in. And out. Good, let's reach up together. Whoa. And we have room to reach out and expand. Good, and just luxuriate in some nice shoulder rolls for a moment. And part of the human experience with nerves is to shake. <laughs> there, a little neck roll. And then just take a moment to notice any body sensations that you have. The body practice of noticing body sensations <coughs> is really, really key to engaging in this work. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you. So, diving in. Um, so we're really covering the what of like, what is white supremacy culture, but we only have time in an hour to cover five characteristics mm -hmm. and the antidotes. Um, when we, when we get into the work, we'll, you'll see that there's 11 proposed characteristics and antidotes. I've made an observation through my work. I've added two more 
um, that I'm tossing around. But I, I do want to provide a little bit of why we're doing this in context of this conversation. Um, you know, why is it important to dismantle white supremacist culture? Um, and, and Liddy Vez and I hope, so we're, we do have a second presentation scheduled to present the second set of characteristics. And then our hope is with Darren to coordinate a third to talk about the why, why we're doing this. What, what are the costs of oppression to both white and black and brown bodied people um, with upholding white supremacist culture? So, so in, my, in my work in this sphere, I have come to understand that all white people are racist. Welcome. It's a good time to join. <laughs> um, so so I, this is a fact, right? That, that white people are racist and, and it's no longer disputable. Okay, we don't, we're not going back and forth about this anymore. It's well supported in literature and discussions, um, which can be accessed you know, through the work of Tim Wise, Robin D'Angelo, Peggy McIntosh, Jim Wallace and, and Resma and so many more people, Resma Minikin. Um, so because racism is prevalent and is constructed into our policy and procedures and systems and individual interactions, this also means that black and brown people are susceptible to colorism. And colorism is offering lighter skinned people more power or privilege. Um, it's standing up for white people regardless of noticing harm. It's enacting oppressive, so as a black or brown person, it's enacting oppressive behavior to other black and brown people who might have less power than you. So both, both are true. White people are racist and black and brown people can be susceptible to colorism because of these waters we're swimming in. Um, okay, so that sink in. A little bit, you might feel it on a body level. Uh, if so, all white people are thinking with racial bias. All white people contribute to racial inequity and in systems that we belong to. Uh, we're no longer disputing if we're racist. We're we're asking the questions of how, why, and when am I racist or colorist? When am I enacting my power and privilege to oppress a black or brown person? for white people or a darker shade for black or brown people. Um, and you know, although most of us are enacting the spectrum of racism that's unintentional, it still really creates harm and has serious effects on relationship. Um, you know, for all of us. Mm -hmm. That's really the point of white supremacy culture that's it's really not healthy for any of us. Mm -hmm. um, Okay, so, you know, in my thinking, if, if this is inherited, right, I've inherited white supremacist culture, it's learned embodied knowledge, then I can unlearn it, or I can learn a different way that can become reflexive instead of the characteristics of white body supremacy. Um, so in thinking about how do I reduce my harm, how do I minimize my use of power and privilege, understanding the characteristics of white supremacy culture have been really freeing for me. Um, understanding the antidotes, now I, I'm understanding a culture that's not aiming to suppress anyone. And that, that's, that's new because I've always lived in white supremacy. I haven't lived in whiteness without supremacy. Mm -hmm. So really that's, that's the key that we're going for. Um, and the antidote culture is really more aligned with kind, loving humanity that's not trying to win or defend. <clears throat> so I'm, I'm beginning to understand it and I'm beginning to, to be able to be white while not always enacting my power and privilege. But I am absolutely enacting harm still and it's, a, it's an ongoing process. Um, and, and I noticed that while I am living into my white bodied supremacy, I'm actually at my most immature state. Um, so I have kind of started thinking about white supremacy as white bodied immaturity. Um, 
And I, I recognize that immaturity is, is a trauma-based reaction that's reflect, reflexively occurring. And, and so, and, and this realization did not come to me alone. None of this work does. It was, it's been really supported in, in this, this book, um, My Grandmother's Hands. So I wanna read a piece that, that directly speaks to this. For white Americans, the most important task in dissolving white-bodied supremacy involves separating whiteness from supremacy. Over the centuries, American leaders have welded the two concepts together in millions of white minds, or more accurately, millions of white lizard brains. So this is going to the reptilian activated brain. <clears throat> this has resulted in large numbers of Americans who are white, racist, and proud to be both. Okay, that's one into the spectrum, um, an even larger a number who are white, oh sorry, yes, white, racist, and in reflexive denial about it, and another cohort who are white, progressive, and ashamed or feel guilt about their whiteness, which also locks us into not being able to heal. Um, all of these forms are, all of these are forms of immaturity. All can be trauma responses and all harm black and brown bodied people and white Americans. Um, so Resma calls us into action and says, grow up, start caring for fellow human beings and earn the respect you crave. And of course, this is page 271 in his very thorough book about coming from this from a very compassionate perspective of healing the trauma that is passed on through DNA. And so my, my work has shifted to trying not to shame or blame and trying to catch my guilt before it turns into shame and transition it into learning and integration and being better, you know, being better. Anything you want to add to that? <laughs> I think you said it all. <laughs> okay. Um, so is there anything you want to, do you want to, look at the white supremacy and point anything out, or you're doing the culture. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if we look at the slide, we just you know, acknowledge that culture is constructed knowledge shared by a group of people. White supremacy is that ideology that creates you know, the thinking, that, that gives us permission to, tr to treat black and brown people lesser than. Um, you know, one of them, coercion and collusion to protect the culpability of white people. Um, white bodies deserve better care, right? These are some of the beliefs that are part of white supremacy. Black bodies can be brutalized. Um, and then like the darker, the scarier or less valuable. Light skinned people are superior to dark skin. And, and white supremacy, the danger of it is that it's normal and it's mainstream and everything else is other which is also why we're trying not to say people of color because white is a color mm -hmm. and, and people of color is another othering sense mm -hmm. in relationship to white. Mm -hmm. So when we're looking at uh, white supremacy culture, just like um, Lindsay has emphasized that we are all, well, all white people are racist, is the idea that black and brown race individuals cannot be racist. That's just merrily impossible. Um, because you don't have the power. We do not have the power and privilege. However, we're all swimming in these infested waters. So for those of you who are familiar with Robin, uh, uh, Robin D'Angelo's work, um, White Fragility specifically by Eric Dyson, um, who forwarded that particular book, and other works of, of many people, black and brown race have done in the past, is really looking at the idea that we're all swimming, as a paraphrase, in these infested waters. We're all exposed to it. Right, um, and we're going to dig deeper into this when we go over the case study, um, because we wanted to really provide pointing examples of what that looks like. Right, when you are um, a brown or, or black race individual still practicing um, racism because of the white supremacist cultures that we're all exposed to, from media to individuals that we speak to to structures academically as well as in other institutions. So it's merely impossible for you not to have those practices because you have been exposed to it. Um, so the American waters we all swim in, um, I would even take that to a global scale, but that's not what we're here for. 
um, <laughs> artificial historically constructed to protect white wealth. So we basically know um, or have an idea of what those pervasive um, practices are. And for today's session, we kind of wanted to give you examples that would resonate best with um, an academic institution to really unpack them. Yeah. And, and just to be extra explicit, white supremacist culture does include KKK, but we're talking about the subtle, nuanced Absolutely. ways that we participate in it daily. Mm -hmm. um, the unavoidable waters mm -hmm. that we were all born into, right? Mm -hmm. and, and we can shift the current of them by learning more. Okay. So the characteristics we'll be reviewing today are perfectionism, defensiveness, fear of open conflict, individualism, and right to comfort. Um, so for those online, you have the white supremacy culture um, worksheet. I wanna be very clear that I, when I edited this, I cut out information that's vital to the learning process under fear of open conflict. Um, so I, I have redone it for the page for people in person. Um, but if you go, because this is not mine and Lidivez's work, right? This is work that is credited um, at the top and the whole first mm -hmm. section talks about who has helped contribute to this. I, I, you know, I wanna make clear that I edited it incorrectly. So if you go to dismantlingracism.org, you can find the correct text for, um, it's the antidote that I cut short for fear of open conflict. So we'll talk about it in person, but just so the online people know. And also provides 11 characteristics as well. We have provided five, right. as Lindsay alluded to, because we're gonna focus on five today. Okay, so perfectionism. When I say that, do you get a sense of that being alive in you? <laughs> um, so there's, there's so many things to highlight with perfectionism, but one of the things that I wanna focus on is that making a mistake is confused with being a mistake. And so oftentimes in white supremacist culture, when we, when we make a mistake, when, when someone says you, you did something wrong, we feel that we are wrong. So in white supremacist culture, when someone says, you just enacted your racism, you go, oh my gosh, I'm a terrible person, right? Versus, oh, right, I did. I did something wrong and I need to learn how to shift that behavior. Um, And there's also a tendency in perfectionism to identify what's wrong versus appreciating what's right. <clears throat> we, we often talk to other people about the ina inadequ inadequacies of a person rather than directly communicating it with them. Um, there's more effort on pointing out faults or failures. So when we look at, oh, oh, and one more good point, right, is that in, in perfectionism, um, we often work from a very harsh, constant inner critic. And you can imagine that if white people do that with ourselves, then we're going to do it even more harshly with black or brown people because we have the power and the privilege. And under white supremacist culture, we have the understanding that we can do that. It's, it's more tolerated, okay? So the antidote um, behavior says where it is expected that everyone will make mistakes, those, make mis those mistakes create opportunities for learning. So I will tell you as a personal example, every night when I sit down with my family for dinner, I ask my five-year-old son first, what mistake did you make at school today? And he can answer it a lot easier than my husband can answer it, <laughs> my white husband. And I struggle to come up with those answers too. Um, but it's become a really interesting practice for us. Um, and, and clinically in supervision for nurses and therapists, and you know, it's really important to say, like, what happened today that didn't go well? And let's learn from those mistakes together. 
Um, this is also important that's hit home with me. Realize that being your own worst critic does not actually improve the work. It often con contributes to low morale among the group and it does not help you or the group to realize the benefit of learning from mistakes. So beating yourself up in front of everyone, the antidote is to try to say, wow, yeah, like this is what happened and this is my growth that I'm taking from it. Defensiveness. So I, I wanted to preface, um, both Lindsay and I had a lot of rich discussion. <laughs> this is, um, I, I guess, uh, um, just a segment of what we have discussed. But in our discussions, we realized that a lot of these characteristics are, are truly linked with one another, right? They stem from each other. So segueing into perfectionism, the idea that it's impossible for you to be wrong, <laughs> you're going to defend an idea when you are wrong right? Which is defensiveness in itself. So it's the idea that um, people respond to new or challenging ideas with defensiveness, making it very difficult to raise these ideas. A lot of energy in the organization is spent trying to make sure that people's feelings aren't getting hurt or working around defensive people. Um, and I don't want to jump around, but we're going to speak to other characteristics that really are also linked with defensiveness, which is the idea, if I'm wrong, make me feel comfortable because it's impossible that I can actually be wrong, right? The defensiveness of people in power creates an oppressive culture. So if someone is always right, if someone feels that they're always perfect, it's impossible for them to be, to be wrong, there is no growth, so there's no evolution, but you're also oppressing a culture um, because you have to have an oppressor to have someone that's being oppressed, right? So there's the, the oppressor and then there's someone being oppressed. But if there's no balance in terms of trying to delegate or discuss right or wrong, then there's only one right, which means that there has to be a wrong, right? Um, so um, being shut down in conversation, not allowing room for growth, and the antidote to that would be understand the link between defensiveness and fear, which means that if you are not, def if you are, have the ability to agree that you are wrong, then you have the ability to somehow give up the fear of being wrong, um, losing face, losing comfort, losing privilege, right? Which many of those factors stem to perfectionism and stem to the idea that you will always be right. Um, working on your defensiveness, of, defensiveness, naming um, defensiveness as a problem. So being transparent and being um, true to yourself that there is a possibility that you could be wrong. And oftentimes as humans, we are. Um, and another antidote is discussing ways in which defensiveness or resistance to new ideas gets in the way of the mission. So it's beyond the individual and it's a bigger picture of everyone feeling equitable and no one feeling oppressed. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's impossible to not touch on the costs of oppression to all of us by living in white supremacist culture, but with defensiveness, you know, Livy has alluded to it, that if we as, as white people, if the expectation is that we are the right, that we are right, then when we're told we're wrong, it's like, ah, oh, that is a disaffinity for us. That I don't understand how do I live with the discomfort of, of being wrong. Mm -hmm. And I know that sounds absurd. Of course, we all know that we're wrong. But living with it in that moment and being called out can be really vulnerable. And that, mm -hmm. that you know, touches into the, the white fragility piece. Mm -hmm. um, it also helps us, uh, or when we look at fear of open conflict, right, the, it, it makes sense that, uh, I, you know, I want to avoid any issues that cause discomfort um, because, because the white, the white body person has had the right to comfort, which we'll get to, but black and brown people are always feeling discomfort. It's nothing, mm -hmm. it's nothing new, right? But it is new for us. Um, so with the fear of being, or the fear of open conflict, there, there becomes this emphasis when, when you are addressed, um, to be addressed with politeness. Um, so one of the, one of the antidotes is, is to role play ways to handle conflict before the conflict happens. Or just role play period. Conflict's always happening, but role play it, right? Role play it um, 
Yeah. And then distinguish between being, what, what does polite mean to you and why is that important when, when hard issues are being raised? Um, so, you know, the antidote is don't require those who raise hard issues to raise them in acceptable ways to you, right? It's like, you can tell me, but I'm going to really work on the quality in which you tell me, mm. right? And that, that is just because of the discomfort of fear of open conflict that we have going on. Um, and here's, here's the danger. When we focus on the person who was raising it, if, if we focus on this idea, this quantifier that they were rude or impolite or out of line, then we're not actually getting to the difficult issue that is trying to be raised. And it's really hard for a black or brown person to have the courage to call a white person out. And if we act in defensiveness or avoidance or naming rude or you're out of line, then the message that was trying to be conveyed is missed. Um, and then once an issue is resolved, or not even resolved, once it's addressed, you know, keep taking the opportunity to revisit it and see how you might have handled it differently. Okay. So we're running over. Okay. Am I individualism? Yes. Um, okay, so individualism. I mean, essentially when we think about the antidote, we're, we're looking at collaborating and collective effort and democracy. And because, you know, although that's slower, the results are more sustainable on an organizational level. Um, in individualism, the organization values those who can get things done on their own without needing supervi supervision or guidance. But that can lead to isolation. Um, there's also an in individualism, this lack of accountability. You know, you might hear someone say, I'm only accountable to my boss, which means I'm accountable to the person higher than me that has more power than me. I'm not accountable to the constituents I serve or to my peer. But that's what we want to get away from. Um, we want to use staff meetings as a place to solve problems, not just a place to report activities. And you know, if you're if you're in the position of measuring peers or supervisees, you want to encourage um, evaluation of people's ability to work in a team, rather than their ability to work independently on their own and get things done alone without the contribution of others. Okay. So moving right along, right to comfort. Um, which is going to be our last characteristics for this session, is the belief that those with power have a right to emotional and psychological comfort. And we touched on this earlier. Um, and this is, right to comfort is a characteristic that really resonated with me. Um, I'm a Latin, brown, black race woman. Um, and I say it because for a lot of black and brown race individuals, they don't believe that they're they're also involved in this right to comfort, right? That when you see a white race person, there's the idea of like, let me open the door or can I hold something for you? And these are behaviors that are unconscious because we're not aware of them, but it's the way society has scaffolded these different um, um, structures so that there is, again, a superior group and an oppressed group. So there's behaviors that are manifested. So right to comfort, when you look at it from um, an institutional perspective or for us who are colleagues, what are those behaviors that are being manifested? Who are we listening to? Who are we comforting? Um, who are we being submissive to? Who do we feel comfortable speaking to um, as it relates to issues? Um, another important point, equating individual acts of unfairness against white people with systemic racism which daily targets people brown or black race individuals. Um, so I'm being very particular with the language I'm using and defining these terms. The antidote would be understand that discomfort is at the root of all growth and learning. And I can't emphasize this enough. You will feel discomfort when you have these conversations. They are difficult conversations. Void of discomfort, we have a problem because it means that we're not moving anything forward. Um, welcome it as much as you can, deepen your political analysis of racism and oppression so you can have a strong understanding. Um, and then there's the idea of doing the individual work, right? We can have, sit, be here in the session, we can listen to this information, take it home, and then there's a deeper work that we have to do 
um, collectively to be able to propel this movement forward. And I will say I've been in white affinity groups where um, white people have said, I don't, I don't have to be a part of this conversation mm -hmm. and they've left the room. Okay. So that's avoiding the responsibility because I, I, I deserve to be comfortable. I have the right to comfort, right? That that's all white supremacist culture. Okay. So it's a lot to take in and <laughs> <laughs> our instinct initially was to stop here and just talk and see how this has landed. Um, but we do have this case study in which, you know, we'll present the case study and then Liddy Vez is the student and I am role playing the clinical instructor. And then we activate our learning by determining which characteristics um, the clinical instructor has enacted. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And also the student. And, and also the student. In, in the, they're not in the some characteristics. Circumstances. Yeah, mm -hmm. but, we, mm -hmm. but they're part of the. So this, does anyone just, I know uh, we have comments up here. Um, Okay. Really. No, there's just been chats about other stuff. Any just quick feedback? It's not. It's not a quick process, and it's not a. But anything that feels kind of urgent or burning to share from participants? Just thank you. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was just going to say. I think it's. It's great work. It's. I always wonder, like, how, how do you how do you take the next step, right? And that there needs to be this kind of common awareness that we're doing it, right? Um, cool. So I was thinking about the the perfectionism part and 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 having being willing to say, you know what, I was wrong. Let's mm -hmm. let's keep going, right? Yeah. Where mm -hmm. in in a place like that, I think others how it can be viewed because of how we've been set up mm -hmm. and because of how the culture sees. The need for perfection with other yes. people can view that as kind of you brushing it off, right? Mm -hmm. Got it. I was wrong. Okay, let's right. let's go forward. And, this, and other people are like, no, let's sit in this for a while. Right? Uh -huh. Let's sit, uh -huh. let's steep in this, right? And so we all need to kind of be on board for absolutely for, for these things to to really move forward, or else I think others get lost in okay, hold on, what are we doing now? Absolutely. Right? Or, or, pushing for these things that have been so a part of the culture. Yes. It's not even just like a white thing, just so a part of how we move right. that it's hard to separate from it. Um, so that was one of the things that stood out to me. And that's an excellent um, response and comment. And I agree with you, I think we all agree. Um, we we wanna be able to go through the case study to yeah. add context yeah. to what you're saying. Yeah. And I am gonna respond quickly by just saying that it starts with leadership. And, I, and I've been in different spaces having these conversations. I know Lindsay has as well, because this is definitely a journey and a work that we're doing collectively at 11th Street, and also the visual work that we're doing, because you can't hang up your allyship. But it starts with leadership. It starts with role modeling. It starts with individuals who have the power and the privilege to make a change, to start making that change, mm -hmm. so that others can feel comfortable and saying, this is how we're doing things now. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I want to, looking at Meryl's comment, is it possible to quickly restate the antidote to fear of open conflict? Um, so we can probably repeat that. It also sends you the um, information we have, Meryl. And then going back to um, John's question, we wanna be able to go back to that once we go over the case study, because it's an excellent response. Yeah, and John, I, I'll just add in saying that um, it's like trauma-informed care. Once you learn about it, you can't help but pass it on. Absolutely. And I intentionally did not wear a turtleneck today because I always get red and nervous and speckly. <laughs> and I wanted to show that part of letting go of perfectionism is speaking up even when it's not perfect. Like, mm -hmm. I'm... I'm messing this up, you know, it's, but we have, we have to share the knowledge mm -hmm. we, and we have to, we have to reveal our vulnerability and, and, and know that we're all in this together. Absolutely. <clears throat> so fear of open conflict, um, the antidote. Um, so role play ways to handle conflict. That's part of it. Um, don't require those who raised hard issues to raise them in acceptable ways. So don't quantify, right? And I know it can feel like, wow, this feels really tough to hear. And 
that feels rude. And, but the people who are delivering the hard news are under a lot of stress and pressure. And they've been usually oppressed their whole embodied life. So it's not easy for them. And as, as professors and students, sometimes they're 30, 40, 20 years our, what do you call that? Senior. No, junior, thank junior. you. Right, so they're, if we think about it as, as immature, like white bodied, white immaturity culture, then they're learning how to articulate their points. So we, as more emotionally mature people, have to just take the message, no matter how it's delivered, and work at the content. I hope that makes sense. Um, and, then, and then the other antidote point is to take the opportunity to revisit it, reflect on it, and, um, and understand how you might have handled it differently. And that doesn't always need to be solved with the person who was in the interaction, but it needs to be solved on your behalf so that you don't perpetuate harm in the same way again. So we're going to take the next few minutes to go over the case study, the script, and then hopefully we can unpack a little bit. Um, so for those of you who are online, there is a case study titled Racialized Trauma and Racial Inequity in a Hospital NICU that I believe Darren shared. So you should have that. Um, so you can follow along. Yeah, if, if anybody didn't receive the materials, send an email to tuesdaytopics at drexel.edu and I'll respond with the materials. Thank you, Darren. A black race 27 year old graduate nursing student is on clinical rotation at a hospital NICU. Upon glancing through the glass of the NICU when she arrives one morning, she notices a disturbing sight. Most of the white race babies are being kindly tended to by the nurses, while two dark skinned babies are crying in distress with no attention from the nurses. The student walks in immediately and approaches one of the unattended babies. She notices that a baby Neil's ankle band was so tight that it was cutting his skin. While feeling a wave of emotion, the student takes several deep breaths. She then approaches one of the NICU nurses, also a black race woman and says, excuse me, I know this baby Neil is crying in distress. I think it's because his ankle band is so tight that it has caused a cut. It looks like it might be impacting his circulation and causing major discomfort. The nurse walks over to baby Neil to assess him. She notices his distress as well and some discoloration on his small ankle. The nurse cuts off the band and softly murmurs, new nurses in reference to a few newer nurses on the unit who she imagines placed the band. The nurses glance the stand at the student to thank her for having a vigilant eye. Although relieved, the student feels <clears throat> overwhelmed, confused, and deflated. She is convinced this was an act of racism and bias. She wonders what would have happened if she wasn't there. She takes another deep breath and utters softly in her frustration, I need to speak to someone. The student finds her clinical instructor, a white race woman, to check in about the event. Student explains her story, refer to the case study. Um, hmm. it, it sounds like that was a horrible experience, but it, it also sounds like the team assessed it. You know, we have new nurses on staff, so we need to consider the circumstances. Most of our new, new nurses are still in their training period. Um, the ban has been removed, right? Yes, but what would have happened if I, was not, if I didn't notice? Why weren't the other nurses who were in the NICU at the time paying attention? He was crying and the band was cutting him. Remind me, Lady Buzz, this is your, is this your first rotation in the NICU? It is. All right, so you probably will have noticed by now that NICU babies are always crying. You, you know, you're gonna see some tough stuff during your clinical rotations. I, I know it can be hard to stomach sometimes, um, but you, you gotta stay strong and move through it. It also sounds like the problem has been resolved. Well, you're, you're probably right, but it couldn't help but wonder if, I had, if it had to do with racism. You know, Baby Neil was one of the two dark-skinned babies in the NICU, and both were unattended and crying. And it seemed like all the other white race babies were being coddled and attended to. It almost felt like he was being treated worse than the other newborns, despite his desperate crying. What? I don't, why would you think that? The health of our patients always comes first. Again, he was a black race newborn not being helped, and no one cared that he was being injured. Or if they cared, it's like they didn't even feel he deserved to be comfortable. Yeah, but I've worked with so many of those NICU nurses. They're, they're good people. I've never had an issue with them. 
they work hard and they're caring and they're loving. And also, by the way, didn't you say that the other nurse was an African-American woman? How and why would she be practicing racism? And there was another black baby without a tight band. Anyway. Well, I'm not saying they're not good people. I'm sure they are, but. <sighs> okay, you know, I, I guess if, if you think racism is influencing how a NICU patient is being treated, then speak out. Speak out against them in the moment without giving up. You have to stand up for what you think is right in this work. Okay, I guess. Thank you for your time. You know, I'm glad you brought it up. I, I hope you feel better now, and especially since the problem's been resolved. <laughs> I will not be quitting my day job. <laughs> Part of my fragility is that I don't get to read the antidotes, and most people walk away with me, you know, feeling disembodied. So I think as a group, why don't we go through each line and um, and go back to the characteristics and see if we can move. Do I have to click the mouse again? Yeah, maybe. Okay. Here we go. And we can probably do this in the next three to four minutes. Because <laughs> um, we're really interested in, in learning what, what has been unpacked. And the same thing goes for the online um, audience. <laughs> So with the, with the clinical instructor's first line, you know, what, what felt inactive? Which characteristics felt inactive with that one? The original one, not the antidote. Right, the original, the original. Yes, one. Thanks for pointing that yeah, out. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right to comfort, maybe? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. It seems like it's like, hey, these other nurses, Need to think about them, and, and, and so they're new. Give them some time. And, mm -hmm. uh, let's not be too critical. Yeah, and also kind of a dismiss, you know, dismissed attitude. I don't, you know, I don't need to deal with this. I might even like, and right at the end, the, and she says it's throat that. The clinical instructor says it several times, the band has been removed, right? Which is um, the fear of open conflict. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's very much like, but it's done now. Right. But it's done now. Right. Let's wrap it up and move mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. Also, the band's been removed, right? Mm -hmm. How does that, does that feel open or does that feel defensive, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I think Chloe online got her just right. Right to comfort. Yeah, absolutely. Nice. Chloe. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, clinical instructor, remind me, is this your first rotation in the NICU? NICU babies, that, that segment. What, what comes up for us there? I think still with the defensiveness, but in that, an element of dismissiveness. Uh huh. Just dis she's dismissing any going any, and that might be fear of conflict too. Going any deeper into the situation. Right. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so when you notice the quality of communication, you might begin to deepen your understanding of how you enact defensiveness. Mm -hmm. Right. Maybe I'm dismissive, and maybe I'm politely dismissive. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh, don't worry about it. It'll be okay. But that's a def. Right, there's something in me. It doesn't always have to be mean, mm -hmm. the defensiveness, you know. But the recipient will always feel devalued. Exactly. Yeah. The impact is always felt. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it also feels like trying to encourage individualism in the student. Uh huh. Saying, like, well, you have to take on this responsibility of walking around NICU babies, and it's going to be really hard if you, it's almost like if you, if you want to cut it here, you're going to have to get through it. So it's, it's encouraging that structure. Absolutely. Yes. And I would, I, you know, that's really relevant in the like, well, if you feel like racism is present, then you I represent it. it. You do yeah. it. Right. Rather than a sense of collective accord, I will help you with this. I will help you move forward. In the antidote, we say even we don't have a Black Nurses Association at Drexel, but there is a <coughs> national Black, Black Nurses, you know, so the, the clinical instructor is referring 
to a different constituent um, that might be helpful and supportive. And then the, the antidote clinical instructor is saying, um, I will also do my work and refer to our EOD, no, equity, OEI, OEI, EOI, OEI, OEI. sorry, <laughs> all of that. Um, you know, but so like making it a more of a collective effort and then taking accountability to say, I will follow up with you on my efforts that I make at, at tackling this health inequity with you versus saying, it seems like your problem, so deal with it alone. Um, for the student, when she says, well, you're probably right, what, what do you think the student is protecting there for the clinical instructor? Oh, I think the, um, the, the right to comfort. Uh-huh. And um, the student is playing along with, not playing along, but ceding to uh -huh. what the clinical instructor has communicated around wanting to shut it down. Yeah. Uh, you know? And, and her and the clinical instructor's assertion of her of her power. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And we have two individuals online who also echoed what you just said, Sherry. Mm -hmm. There was a right to comfort, and I believe Chloe said um, she was protecting discomfort. So I guess kind of in the same vein of saying, I don't want to make this white person feel uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. So I'll let it go. Because it's going to be bad news for mm -hmm. me, right? Because mm -hmm. I sense that my safety has already been threatened. Absolutely. Somehow. Mm -hmm. It could also be an element of perfectionism mm -hmm. because uh -huh. this instructor right. is right. setting the bar for Absolutely. what is correct and she right. wants to use the student Absolutely. in that power relationship so she has to Great. elevate her professionalism and there's in the several eyes privileges there Kev. Yeah. there's several privileges because there's a privilege of the white race person but the privilege that you are my superior mm -hmm. right which is another privilege that we don't speak about but there's elements of privilege that are being compromised mm -hmm. so um Someone says the student nurse is also protecting herself as she is in a vulnerable position. Absolutely. Her clinical grade relies on a positive evaluation from the faculty. Absolutely. It's so true. <laughs> yep. Um, yeah, so for the antidote, we really encouraged, you know, we, we knew that we wouldn't get to it realistically, <laughs> but we also knew that text is very important. And that having a little bit of a guide for how to improve this communication is important. So if you can read through it for everyone um, to get a sense. Now, when Liddy Vez and I were role playing it yesterday, we were like, well, we would change that a little bit. It doesn't quite feel totally natural. So, um, you know. Says the experts in the room, the theater. <laughs> oh, gosh, yeah. <laughs> Um, but, you know, the clinical instructor in the antidote has prioritized um, body-based practice. Mm -hmm. and, and, I, and any of us can do that. Mm -hmm. Any of us can do that. But we do have to increase our comfort with, with doing it. Um, so, yeah. I, I did want to read one more comment um, from the individual who spoke about the vulnerability. And he or she says, and the student probably doesn't continue to push the issue, the issue as she doesn't want to be perceived as the angry black woman which is how we are often labeled in the society. But the student may have something to be angry about. Um, and that's a great point. And, I, and so just like um, Lindsay said, definitely take the time to read through this. I, we know coming in, this was dense conversation. We know it was gonna be uncomfortable. We have become comfortable with feeling discomfort, as we say at 11th Street. But I also wanted to point out the antidote because it does speak to your question earlier, John, when you said, how do we model? And I think that's the most perplexing part when you have been driven by these structures, everyone you know is driven by these structures. Like we say, we drank the Kool-Aid. How, how do you not drink the Kool-Aid? And that's very, very difficult to do because you do need these guys. Um, but it starts with conversation, and that's exactly what we did here today. I do want Lindsay to highlight the work that we're doing at 11th Street. Okay. Um, it's impossible. Oh my gosh. It's and this, it, in exactly that. 60 um, seconds. Yeah. Well, I, I, can I just, so for every, everything that is said that is uncomfortable, if you can come back to see what, where it fits. So I just want to say that the, the angry black woman, the, that characterization, 
if you look at fear of open conflict, that's the call to us to not qualify how someone's delivering information. Mm -hmm. And then it's also, you know, that if, if someone um, says, well, oh, you're getting angry, I'm not okay with that, then that's, then that's the black or brown person saying, right, and if I create conflict for you, because you have fear and discomfort with having it publicly witnessed, et cetera, then nobody's good here, right? So nobody's safe. Um, but also just to always, we say at 11th Street, comfort is not safety, right? right. You can have safety Absolutely. in discomfort. Absolutely. So at 11th Street, um, uh, the work around, um, so Center, Center for Healthcare Strategies, we're doing advancing integrated uh, models and our anti-racism work really spearheaded by Dr. Roberta Waite has deepened our uh, ability to dive into this work, to create initiatives that we are then, you know, looking to produce outcomes for. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, it's really important to us that a funder is willing, absolutely, you know, to support this content and our exploration with it and, and is interested in our outcomes. So if this in any way spurs um, different facilitated work in your respective departments or centers, uh, let us know, you know, because we're, th this is part of, I mean, we did this on our own, but I mean, it's not a part of the AIM initiative to do this presentation, but it absolutely is, right? And it's, it speaks to the individual a, work that we're doing in this journey as well. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So we want to thank everyone for their time, for being here, for carving out the time to be here. Um, we hope this was as fruitful for you as it was for us in developing it. Um, and you guys have our emails as well, which is at the end of this slide. If you want to reach out to us, you definitely can. Um, and we are receptive and welcome to any questions um, or conversation. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank yeah. you, everybody. Thank you so much. Sarah. Yes, there will be another uh, workshop series in week oh. six of spring quarter. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Pull them up on the screen now. Our next one's May 5th. May 5th. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's, that was the only available time. The slots in are the booked. the Tuesday topics. In the Tuesday topics. Right. Um, so that'll be the second half of the antidotes, and then we're planning one to do the cost of oppression. Right. And during the summer, we can do longer. So if okay. you need a longer okay. session, we can make that happen. Awesome. It's just, we're not under the same, like, hour breaks between morning classes and afternoon classes okay. in the summer. Okay, great. Oh, we didn't do our, our well. Um, and then for all of us here, I just want to express that we're always on this continuum of healing. Um, and so I, you know, the call, especially supported by Resma Minikin, is to remain compassionate with each other while we do this work and hold each other accountable. Yeah. Compassionate while holding each other accountable. Thank you. Well, thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, you very much. much.